picture of one out of a catalog of a supplier of Masonic regalia. Notice that the caption calls this hat noble, the noble fez. However, the truth behind the fez is rather disturbing and not noble at all. This story was told to me by a friend of mine named Mick Oxley, who is not only an ex-Mason, but also an ex-Muslim who lived in the area of the world where the fez hat is worn by other people. Mr. Mo Mr. Oxley shared this story with me, and I would like to share it with you. He assured me that the story is well known in Morocco, the area where the town of Fez is located. During World War II, Mick Oxley was a Muslim, and he lived in the area. He tells the story of a town in North Africa called Fez near Algiers. You can see it in the middle of this map. In around 800 AD, the Muslims entered the town of Fez and slaughtered somewhere between 20,000 to 50,000 Christians. They slaughtered the people, men, women, and children, simply because they were Christians. The story continues that the blood ran so heavy after the slaughter that the town was red and that the Muslims dipped their hats in the blood of the Christians as a sign of their victory over their victims. And the hat, which is made only in the town of Fez, is a 1,200-year symbol of their victory over the Christians. And the Shriners wear Fezes. You can ask and then answer the question for yourself as to whether or not the Shriners in America know the story about their hat. But I want you, the viewer, to know that I believe that at least certain Shriners know the story of the Fez. Later, I will show you the evidence that the Masons take an oath to destroy Christianity, just like the Muslims did when they murdered Christians in the city of Fez, Morocco. So the fact that most Shriners probably do not know the history of their own hat means little to someone like myself, because I can prove that Masons take an oath to destroy Christianity. But the Shriners tell a slightly different story about their fez. This is that book, uh, again, that I showed you a few minutes ago, put out in 1977 by the Sabar Shrine Temple in Tucson. On page five of this book, the Shriners tell us, it's on the right-hand side of this uh, uh, page, on the lower right, that says the fez. The Shriners tell us why they wear the fez, and this is what it says. The fez, which nobles of the mystic shrine of North America have the privilege and honor of wearing, Notice here that the Shriners claim it is a privilege and an honor to wear a hat that commemorates the vicious slaughter of innocent Christian women and children. The quote continues, has been handed down through the ages as one of the most significant headdresses. Now here they admit that the fez is an old item. Mick Oxley says that the slaughter dates back to 800 AD, now over 1100 years ago. The Shriners continue, the fez derives its name from the place where it first was manufactured commercially, the holy city of Fez in Morocco. Notice that here they connect the hat to the holy city of Fez. The, if Fez was considered to be a holy city, the Muslims, Muslims might not tolerate the fact that non-Muslim Christians were living in it. See how the Shriners tell the truth in hidden language? They admit that the wearing of the fez is an old custom and that it was named after a holy city in Morocco. But if you know the entire truth about the city and its strange hat, then their words become understandable. I, th I think the Shriners know the story about the fez. During their initiation ceremony, all of the Shriners, quote, seal their solemn oath in the name of Allah, the God of the Arab, the Muslim and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers. I want you to remember that many Christians in America became Shriners, and during their initiation into the Shriners, these Christians take an oath in the name of Allah. One can only wonder how a Christian can justify that. Later in their ritual, Shriners acknowledge Islam as the only true faith. Once again, you might ask your Shriner friend who is a Christian how he can take an oath in the name of Allah and acknowledge Islam as the one true faith when he is a Christian, a believer in the God of the Bible. He probably will not have an answer. As I said before, the new Mason goes through three initiation ceremonies in the Blue Lodge. During the ceremony, the initiate is asked this question in each of the three de the, uh, degrees. What do you most desire? And the initiate answers, 
In the first degree, he answers, I desire light. In the second degree, more light. And in the third degree, further light. But, this is, but what this light is, or from where it comes, is not easily explained. But if you know where to look, any researcher can discover the source of this light. Albert Pike, in his book, Morals and Dogma, says that the Mason is familiar with the doctrine that the Supreme Being is a center of light whose rays or emanations pervade the universe. For that is the light for which all Masonic journeys are a search, and of which the sun and moon in our lodges are only sem uh, symbols. Emblems, forgive me, only emblems. And so here we see for the first time that the Masons connect this search for light with the sun. I will discuss just what the sun means in the next section of this lecture. This is a drawing of an ad found in a magazine known as Gnosis. Gnosis is Latin for knowledge, and if you will notice, the path in the drawing leads upward to a round object Presuming, presumably the sun. It appears as if the woman on the horse, which you can't see on this picture, but she's at the bottom, is going to the sun, meaning the source of light. So it is not just the mason who is seeking light from the sun. Those seeking knowledge or truth are called Gnostics, and according to Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, who wrote the following on page 386 of her book entitled The Secret Doctrine, it is in the religious doctrines of the Gnostics that the real meaning of the dragon, the serpent, the goat, and all those symbols of powers, now called evil, can be seen the best. In their rituals, the Masons tell the initiate that the light he is asking for is the Masonic truth. But nowhere that I can find do the Masons tell the initiate during the ceremony where this light comes from, nor that it, it is a symbol of something else. But it is possible to know because we can find the answer to that question in other writings of the Masons themselves. To show you that the light is more than a light from the sun or from light bulbs, W. L. Wilmshurst, a member of the Masons, said this in his book entitled The Masonic Initiation. Masonry being essentially and expressly a quest after supernatural light. So this light comes from a god, but the question that that quote does not answer is just which god this light comes from. The answer to that question can be found on page 321 of Morals and Dogma, the book written by Albert Pike. Mr. Pike tells the reader where the light that the Mason asks for comes from. This is what he wrote, page 321, Morals and Dogma. If you don't believe me, check it out yourself. Albert Pike wrote, Lucifer, the light bearer, Lucifer, the son of the morning. Is it he who bears the light? Doubt it not. So the number one Mason of all time says that the Mason receives the light that he is in search of from Lucifer, the light bearer. Lucifer brings the, ma the light to the Mason, but only certain Masons can know it and thereby receive it. Albert Pike has told us in his own words. Once again, that quote may be found on page 321 of Morals and Dogma, if anyone would like to check to see if I quoted Mr. Pike correctly. And to make certain that the reader can know that Lucifer brings the light that the initiate asks for, Mr. Pike repeats the thought on page 324. This is what he wrote on that page, a devil, the fallen Lucifer, or light bearer. So the Mason asks for light from the light bearer Lucifer. And certain Masons know that single truth, and they are keeping that secret from the remainder of the Masons. I'd like to break the narrative at this point to tell you a little story that was told to me by someone who had read my book entitled The New World Order. This gentleman mailed me a copy of a video to document his story, and I have taken some slides from the cameraman's coverage of the event. On Saturday, forgive me, that article's kind of <laughs> upside of my photograph. On Saturday, September the 15th, 1991, Masons in Canton, Ohio, commemorated the assassination of President William McKinley. McKinley was a Mason who apparently was born in or lived in Canton, and the Masons wanted to commemorate his death. They planned the parade that day that ended at the McKinley National Memorial, the resting place of the martyred president. 
This is a slide of the statue of President McKinley in front of the memorial building in the rear. It is interesting to note at this time that the memorial building that we just saw a picture of from the outside has the built-in Masonic symbol in its ceiling. This is a shot of what appears to be a stained glass window at the top of the memorial. If you count the squares with the, sec the second square inside them around the circumference of the circle, you will, the second circle it should be, if you count the squares with the second square inside them, oh, I see what I'm saying, okay. Uh, around the circumference of the circle, you will count 32 of them. And the, then the circle in the inside would be the 33rd. I will explain the significance of this a little later. This is a picture of a funeral hearse carrying the mock casket of the slain president being driven through the city of Canton. The Masons showed up in force wearing their strange regalia and carrying their banners and flags. The following are a series of slides taken from the video showing the various Masonic organizations involved in the mock funeral. This is a slide of the Knights Templar Masons marching behind their flag. The, girl, the group for the, rain, uh, the girls showed up. This is the Rainbow Girls carrying their flag, and some of the girls are shown in the picture. And the Demolay for young men showed up. Uh, this is the group for young men behind their banner. And the Job's Daughters marched as well in their white dresses and behind their flag. And this is a group of the Scottish Rite Masons marching with their aprons on. The man in the hat on the right appears to be their president called the Worshipful Master. These men and women all gathered at the, at the steps at the base of this uh, McKinley uh, uh, Memorial, and there we have the speaker and the Masons in their aprons and their regalia standing behind them. But as they started their speech, they, the audience started to hear an airplane motor. When those in attendance looked up, I know this is very hard to see, but there's a little tiny airplane on the left trailing a large banner. The, they saw this airplane flying the banner and everyone in the audience looked up to hear it because of the noise. The sign that the banner was carrying, I know this is hard to read as well, says, is Lucifer God of, <laughs> is Lucifer God of Freemasonry? The man who organized the airplane flyby told me that the man who made the banner misspelled Freemasonry by leaving out the first R in the word Freemasonry, but other than that, their attempts were successful. I'm quite certain that only a small percentage of the Masons in attendance knew the answer to that question was, yes, Lucifer is the god of the Masons, and I'm going to prove that. But it is certain that some in attendance knew the truth. But to show you that not only can the Mason know the truth from Mr. Pike, he can know it from other Masons. In other words, other Masons have confirmed that Lucifer is the being that brings life to the Masonic Lodge. This is Manley P. Hall's book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. You might remember that Mr. Hall was a 33rd degree Mason and that he was one of the leading writers of all time in the Masonic Lodge. This is a recommended reading list for those who want to know what to buy their Masonic relatives. The book entitled The Lost Keys of Freemasonry is shown on the lower left of the page under the yellow that I put on the, uh, on the listing. In other words, the book is on the recommended reading list for all Masons to buy and then read. The book was not published by the Masons, as was Mr. Pike's book, but here you can see that the Masons are recommending that other Masons should buy this book and then read it. So you can know that this book is one that is recommended by the Masonic Lodge. This is official information. And on page 48 of that book, Mr. Hall says this, quote, when the Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of the living power, he has learned the mystery of the crafts. What that means is that once the Mason has figured it out, that Mason knows the secret of the Masonic Lodge. Notice that this must be the single truth of the Masonic Lodge, because Mr. Hall states that he who has figured it out has learned the secret. Mr. Hall went on. The seeding energies of Lucifer are in his hands. And before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. Notice that I am not quoting from the works of non-Masons. I am quoting from the writings of the Masons themselves. The Masonic writers are telling the public that they conceal a worship of Lucifer from the rest of the Masonic Lodge. It is true. Lucifer is the light bearer, 
And the Mason who figures it out has discovered the single secret of the Masonic Lodge. The Masons have said it themselves.